Hello everyone. Welcome to another episode of Setback Leadership Breaking Glass Ceiling podcast as well as talk show. In today's episode, we talk to Ms. Soumya Mahadevan, the COO of Exeter Premedia Services, a e-publishing company that works with scholarly authors to help them with their publishing as well as technology needs. Soumya was awarded the best student in her engineering college and also bagged seven admissions out of eight that she applied in international colleges in the US and she picked up the best among them Carnegie Mellon with full scholarship she was on the top of her mind she joined there she did her masters in electrical engineering and after that what happened she did not land up in a job from there for the next 10 years Somia went through four or five big dips in her career and personal life. And then today she is the COO of this organization. How was her journey? How did she manage to become that? How did she manage to become the GC member of Tai Chennai and also got rewarded as a distinguished student in her engineering college? all this and more in today's conversation with Soumya Mahadevan let's get inside and listen to the conversation Soumya welcome to the show setback leadership breaking glass ceilings how are you doing today hey, i'm doing fantastic srijata and thank you so much for having me here It's wonderful. Uh, I'm I'm really happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you for accepting the you know accepting the invitation to come here. And I know you have some great stories to share. So we'll straight jump into it, right? So Swamiya, I want you to start your conversation. Tell me, how did you become a professional that you are today? So let me start a little bit. Uh, let me rewind and talk a little bit about my journey. uh to where i am right now uh as soon as i finished my engineering you know that's what everyone did uh, we either became engineers or doctors back then uh, so as soon as i finished my engineering uh, bachelor's here in in chennai i got an opportunity to go to carnegie mellon university with a full scholarship so uh that was one of my high points in my life where out of the eight universities that i applied to i got into seven and uh i got scholarships from three universities it was a super high in my life so i joined carnegie mellon university for a masters program uh completed two years and then i graduated uh at the absolute wrong time that somebody can graduate it was the dot com bust 2001 so i graduated i had gotten into this fabulous university on a high i got out and i had no job i couldn't find a single job so that was like one of the you know the it was like riding a sine wave right so you go on a high and then you come out and you're like searching for a job so i managed to land a job in a startup in dallas uh, in the us uh, as a programmer so I, that's how i started my career and um, here i was you know doing c c sharp and c++ coding and uh, being a enthusiastic developer uh, my my initial company i think i had uh, it, it went okay but not not great uh, at one point i don't think i gelled very well with the team um i tried to take on some projects that uh, directly with the ceo i rubbed my manager on the wrong side just by being overly enthusiastic and i was actually shown the door so again a huge uh, you know slide down uh, from sort of where i started my career so uh, was was quite dejected was a bit of a low point my first job i was asked to kind of like i was practically kicked out of my first job joined another startup and um you know i was working there again an enthusiastic sincere working on java this time and two years into that job my husband comes and tells me that hey you know why you're going back packing up and going back to india and that was certainly not on my plan right so and i was livid uh, to say the least so and, and and it was a huge huge change that you had to adjust to and all my plans of you know being in the us climbing up the corporate ladder was now i was back to square one not knowing what to do uh, but then i said okay let's let's try to make the best or what the situation is and i went and spoke to my boss and i said hey i i need to move back to india but i just don't want to go back to india and look for another job or just work for you you know remotely instead how about we start a unit in india let's start a subsidiary you and me together 
and I'll hire some developers for you. So instead of having 10 developers here in the US now, all of a sudden you can have that many more developers in India. This was just adrenaline talking, right? Because I had absolutely no experience hiring or setting up a, a company or any of that. But it was like, hey, you know what? I'm just enthusiastic. I'm going to give this a shot. He went for it. He went for that pitch and he said, yes, let's do it. And, and that's how I, I came back to India and um, uh, established a subsidiary for, for my parent company and hired a bunch of developers, testers, and grew it up to about, uh, you know, 20 people. I think at one point we had a couple of years, we had 20 people and it was going extremely well. Um, then in this journey, again, uh, there was another bigger company uh, that acquired uh, the startup that I was working for. And all of a sudden here again, I was faced with, I don't, I don't know what was going to happen. Whether this new company wanted an Indian office, whether they did not want an Indian office, even they weren't sure. So for one year, they, um, uh, you know, kind of strung me along. Uh, they made me lay off. They wanted me to lay off about 50% of the people that I had in this small company, which was practically half of everybody, right? So 10 people I had to lay off and had to hold on to the rest. And then a year later, they wanted me to now expand and said, hey, you know what? India seems like a good idea. Let's now expand. And uh, I want you to hire about 150 people. And so then now it's like, you know, all the tight turning again. And, uh, and, and then I you know, established the Indian operations for, uh, for uh, SolarWinds, which is the company, and um, grew it from like about 10 people to about 100 people and moved into a huge office and set up their Indian operations in India. Uh, I think that was, a, that was a, a really great experience for me personally. And a uh, huge, huge uh, learning that, you know, even when things seem to go horribly wrong, that somehow they bounce back and they kind of straighten themselves out. So where I am right now, I am the CEO of Exeter Play Media. This is a, a family run business. Me and my husband, we run it together and very excited about working here and looking forward to great times. Superb, superb. So I, I want to, I'm, I'm just curious, right? Like you just spoke about multi roller coaster rides, right? I mean, uh, you started somewhere and you, you got the admission in seven amazing colleges uh, to go do post graduation. You were probably in your highest uh, enthusiasm, excitement, and confidence level. Then from there, after doing your master's from Carnegie Mellon, you don't land up in a job because of dot com burst, right? And then when you join the first organization, you happen to have hit the first glass ceiling, which I call is the uh, glass ceiling of probably favoritism or a glass ceiling of where your manager just doesn't like you because of certain reason or the other. And you know, or get threatened just because you have been more enthusiastic than he would expect you to be, right? So that was your first glass ceiling. The second one that I would say is in this, you know, second company where you had to move to India, where you were thinking of taking your career to a new heights in the US due to, you know, I would say personal requirements. And then you suddenly land up in India, but you did not let go of it. You, you managed to convince your boss to help you start up a new division in India and then grow it. Like, I want to understand how many years was this entire thing that you spoke about, right? Till you, uh, you know, you grew the company from 10 member to 150 member team. Like, how many years span are we talking about here? This was, um, I think, a total of about 10 years uh, mm -hmm. from, so if you're talking about from when I graduated to when the second company acquired us and I had to grow, uh, was, was, was a 10 year span where you know it was like a high and a low and a high and a low uh, so I think I was about a 10 year 10 year span so amazing like I mean in the 10 years if I have to count whatever you said your uh, you know your biggest high was Carnegie Mellon biggest low was not landing up in a job so that was first one right then you landed up in a job got excited about it you started working on it and then again you got chucked out from the company you just you just shown the pink slip. You you were taken off from the organization. Why? Not because you did not perform, but you overperformed. Let's put it that way, right? So that was the biggest low. So I would say you hit about four, five highs and lows in between this period. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think uh, the highs and lows were of different uh, 
different types of highs and lows but yes there were there were certainly highs and lows and i think about four or five uh, significant highs and lows that i that i ran into during the senior period for sure you know why i'm saying this why i want to you know dissect this entire thing is because i see a lot of leaders shying away from these highs and lows they're happy to go through the highs but the moment it hits a low there is a sense of dejecting dejection there's a sense of frustration there is a sense of why me and all of that but here is someone who's sitting here right here a live example of you who hit four five lows leave alone highs but four five huge blows lows in 10 years span of time still she is sitting as a coo of an organization which she runs with equal vigor and excitement boys and girls leaders out there there is a huge lesson there somya did not give up and so shouldn't you so somya thank you very much for sharing this entire journey i'm so excited about it you know i want to ask you so these have been your experiences in your journey so what has been your worst experience of a glass ceiling or a stereotype or some kind of blockages where you would have felt shit this is the end i can't move forward were there anything like that i don't think you would have but i will still go ahead and ask you this question yeah i think i certainly <laughs> think that the first my first job when i was asked to leave was probably my the lowest simply because you hadn't you i hadn't experienced something like that in the past right it was it was my very first job i was there for a few years a couple of years uh, i thought i did a great job i thought i was being enthusiastic and uh, you know taking on new projects but what i didn't realize was i didn't i i had i'd gone to the ceo and showed him a new prototype instead of going through my manager and i kind of rubbed off a few people on the wrong side along the way and sitting where i am right now i realize that what i did was very naive and probably not right you know politically but back then i just put it all under over enthusiasm and and uh, being um, uh, you know just being energetic and and wanting to eager to do new things so i would say that was probably you know like the worst experience in my life simply because i did not know what to do next and i thought it was unfair um that i that you know the kind of what i faced was quite unfair uh, so i did not know how to come out of that uh, for for a bit uh and she just i think you know in in always in hindsight when you look back at a low you laugh at it and you feel like you know that was the best learning experience but as you're going through it it is still very painful so and i think sometimes you just have to grit your teeth and grow through that right uh so that was one one instance and i think soon after i mean my second really you know very difficult period or low period would uh would be when um when my company got acquired when the indian you know company got acquired and the very first decision that the new company had made was to let go of of uh, half my employees so and they turned to me and said you now you have to fire 10 of your people it was the worst thing i had to do because these were people that i had really struggled i mean you know in india there are brands like infosys and wipro and finding good talent is so hard i had really gone through a lot of trouble to find and find these people and to be able to now sit in front of them and say okay you know you I, i'm sorry i have to let you go was probably one of the worst things that i had to do but in hindsight again now i feel like i'm so thankful i went through that experience even though it was so so horrible to go through because i'm much stronger now if i need to let go of somebody today in where i am sitting it's not it doesn't phase me right it's uh, it's something that i i much more experienced in and uh, so I, i think it's like walking through fire the only way to to uh, to to learn how to deal with some difficult situations is to actually go through them and it is painful it is really painful to go through that particular situation so i i'm at no point taking away the fact that it is painful and you do feel like you do get de- dejected and you do feel horribly low but it passes yeah right i mean i think uh, that's an experience i would like to uh, again dissect a little bit more because current situation is such that a lot of leaders are going through the same dilemma they had hired their teams and they had nurtured mentored worked on their teams and now due to the situation that they, we are facing in the entire world they might have to let go of few people as a leader it's probably one of the most difficult decisions of our life 
our entire career to let go of our people whom we have hired with so much of passion and worked with them and nurtured them and let them grow and suddenly we have to let go so what was your mindset and from which uh you know from which perspective from which mindset did you operate at that point in time that helped you taking that decision that helped you take the right decision of letting go of the right people and also keep the rest because 50% of your team when it goes away the rest of the 50% is scared at the minimum how did you manage to let go those 10 people and how did you manage to keep those 10 people i want to understand that a little bit better sure absolutely so fortunately uh, at that particular situation it was it was a business decision they wanted me to let go of people because that particular function was not no longer you know going to be working out of india so i had to explain it from a business standpoint and i think that that's the uh, the best thing that you can do is to really make people sit down and understand what is going on um you know sometimes you you yourself don't know what is going on right so, but you have to put on an act as if you know and then have to you know comfort people and put uh, you know send the right message uh, but but you have to do that you have to take the time to communicate you have to take the time to really explain um why something is happening what is you know w- what was behind this particular decision and it comes down to a basic business decision in most cases and when put right people will understand uh they will realize that uh you know there's nothing that can be done about it because it is it is a decision that was taken at uh, keeping several factors in mind it was not a personal decision and i think once you get that across uh, it's far more easier as to keeping the rest of the people once i had to you know like like basically let go of half my employees and keep the rest of the people uh, i had to really work hard so there i had to be a little bit smarter i had to put some retention bonuses in place um and uh, and 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 make sure that that you know the rest of the team was there because we couldn't build around um uh, if i'd lost the rest of the uh, the uh, the employees as well uh, so i think that was that was you know i had to i had to put on my let's be smart hat and uh, you know try to try to retain the rest of the employees nice awesome that's what i call a setback leader even though you had to let go of 50% of your uh, you know your workforce the rest of the 50% needed to be retained with a smart hat in the mind in in, in your head head right so great there and now for example you, you had to grow that 10 people team to 120 people you mentioned right you hired 100 plus people in the next one year after one year when they started discuss deciding that yes they wanted to grow in india how that how did that shift happen from 10 people to 100 people team um yeah there, there was a, some aggressive targets uh, so once the once the decision was made to actually grow the indian operations there were some very aggressive targets so we had to like literally hire a lot of people within a very short span of time um grow the space the facilities get all the infrastructure in place of course there was a backing because it was a much larger company and there were uh, you know other departments that were coming in and helping out but at the end of the day the buck stopped with me so that's where you 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 just have to be resourceful uh, but that was a good problem to solve i think i enjoyed solving that problem because it was growth right and i was and i was getting more people to come in and and, and suddenly there were more opportunities uh, so while it was hard and it was something that you had to do for a within a very short span of time it was an enjoyable problem so i i kind of like uh you know just reached out networked quite a bit and tried to bring in these people yeah nice nice great so you have had a illustrious career even though you have been through ups and downs in your uh, I would life say that it's, <laughs> i'm still learning and growing so by no means is that an illustration that's 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 your uh, that's your humility talking somya that's totally your humility talking and i know you're a very humble person so that's fine that's all right but i'm still going to say that you have had a career where many people would really want to be there you know because you have had immense amount of learning you're still learning you're still growing with the company uh, you're running a business uh, with your husband right now that itself is a very difficult task running a business with your husband what do you think <laughs> <laughs> of course that, that that gets challenging i think uh, uh any any husband and wife couple that is on a business i'm sure would would have similar stories uh it it gets it gets interesting challenging all rolled in together but it's i think the you have to make it fun uh and you have to make it uh you know a true partnership and then and then you know it's 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 a fun ride it's an adventure <laughs> 
<laughs> right, right. Sure, it is definitely a fun ride. I was just pulling your leg. <laughs> Some fun element in the interview as well, right? So <laughs> uh, let me let me ask you a serious question right now. You you have a team right now, and you you are building a team yourself. In uh, you know, uh, my question is. Uh, are you doing in your organization to help your leaders, help your employees get rid of their stereotypes, their glass ceilings, their blockages so that they are able to grow freely? Is there anything that you're doing specifically? Can you give me a couple of examples on that? Um, I, I'm not sure specifically from a glass ceiling perspective, uh, but I think, uh, you know, we are we're sort of trying to change and grow rapidly so there's a lot of growing pains within the organization i think the 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 best thing that someone has to do is to constantly keep questioning status quo right and and you get into a frame of mind where you're saying what else can i do what else can i do and not be happy with a status quo uh that takes a little bit of a mindset uh it's sort of like the growth mindset versus the fixed mindset but it does take a little bit of a of a mindset shift right to get to that state where you're questioning status quo all the time, it can get a little challenging, but that's kind of what I'm encouraging people in our organization to do is to keep questioning. Okay. Why, why did this happen? How can we do this better? What else? How else can I make it you know, better? And, and the more you question, more you learn and questioning does not mean I'm trying to find fault. I mean, that's, that's one of the, uh, uh, you know, the one thing that people have to get away from is to not be defensive when there is a question coming, but to actually look at every single question as an opportunity to see what else can I do. Uh, and if, if you get into that frame of mind, it can be fun because you're always constantly uh, figuring something out, you're learning, you're solving some problems and, and that in itself, you know, becomes like a really nice adventure that everybody can go on. Uh, so so the, if, if you ask me, what am I doing? It's actually trying to figure out how to get everybody into that frame of mind, into that mindset to say, it's okay when mistakes happen, it doesn't matter, but you know, don't stop that question. Don't don't be okay with with something. You constantly have to at least raise it. Whether you're able to answer the question or not is secondary, right? So you have to first get into the mindset of questioning yourself and just being curious. Yeah, I think I think that's one of the uh, tools that can help any leaders to have a growth mindset and not a fixed mindset. I think that's a brilliant tool for anyone to employ in their organization where you question for the right reasons. What is the next? What can we do better? How can we do it better? And, you know, okay, this problem has been here or the problem or the setback is right here. But what is the opportunity inside that setback? Let's find out that because every opportunity or every setback has an opportunity inside it all we have to do is unravel the whole thing and find that opportunity i think you're doing a great job with that in your organization so uh i'm gonna ask you one more question here you are a leader and i'm sure you would be going through ups and downs setbacks non-setbacks great opportunities non-great opportunities the graph that we were talking about at the beginning very often in your life, right? So what has been your tools or your ways to deal with challenges? What are the three, four things that you do or that you take care of at that point in time that gets you to taking the right decisions, move forward, have the growth mindset in your mind? Um, sure. I think uh, uh, I think it's very tempting to uh, react very quickly when, when bad news hits you. Uh, I think one of the one of the key things that I've learned is to not react immediately. Uh, it to actually kind of like observe what happened and what exactly happened and, and then try to address it the right way. I think just giving yourself even that space to not react immediately, right? Uh, is, is something that's helped me. So you might get a very, you know, a customer who's not very happy with something that we did. Um, and, and and earlier in the past, say a few years back, I would be, oh my God, what happened? And, and there's this there's this sort of like an emotional reaction that happens first. These days, I'm I'm kind of like calming myself to say, you know what? Let's let's observe. Let's see what's going on, uh, and then then respond. Um, uh, you know, in a, in a take some time and then respond. And and oftentimes that that gives you that space to really understand what's going on, and uh, either put in a, a much more of a long lasting solution to whatever happened and also to rally the the team around the problem and say okay how how best do we solve it so whereas if you're having a very emotional reaction you might actually also make everybody around you feel anxious and 
um, get very tensed up, right? So I think that's that's one of the one of the key tools that I'm I've, I've started employing. Right? Lovely. I think there are two things that I picked up from here, and correct me if I'm wrong. One is, of course, stop reacting, start responding thoughtfully without even without that, uh, you know stopping that urge to react immediately and solve the problem immediately because your mental framing will not allow you to solve the problem right there, right then. It is rather to sleep over the problem for some time and then take a decision, an informed, thoughtful response that can really sort the problem out or help you take the right decision. That's one. And the second one that you said is get more people involved. You know, get your team involved to solve the problem. It's not your headache as a leader to solve all the problem alone. This is something I think leaders must realize that it is not their responsibility to solve every problem alone. You can get your team within you and along with you to solve the problem together. This increases the bonding, the trust. This uh, this also increases the the probability of finding the right decision. You know, so therefore, go ahead, ask your team, involve your team, take your team into confidence and then solve the problem. Is there anything that I missed, Somya, here? No, I think I think you got it right. I think the uh, there is sometimes, you know, a tendency to jump in and be the hero when when there is something wrong happening. I think that's just the wrong thing to do. Right. So as and uh, so that's a fine balance between uh, when do you when do you say I am going to you know, jump in and really solve the problem. But it's actually stepping back and enabling your team or coaching your team to solve the problem, I think, has longer lasting uh, results. So which might mean that it may take uh, some time more than if you had jumped in and done it yourself. But uh, that's the investment that you're making for the future. True, very, very true. So uh, I want to ask you this question uh, around uh, leaders themselves, right? So what would be your suggestion to the leaders of today who are facing, say, a glass ceiling problem or a stereotype problem or any other kind of setback in their professional or personal life right now, what would be your suggestion to them? What can they do to ease themselves right now and allow themselves to take the right decision and get the best out of the worst situation? So I think, um, and this may this may sound a little philosophical, actually, but that's not the intention here. But I think anytime something uh, something you know not that that you did not anticipate happens or something that unfavorable happens, there is always a tendency to think, why me? Why am I in this uh, in this situation? And also to look for all the reasons why you you went into this situation. So like I said, when when I didn't get a job, I was happy to blame the dot com bust but nobody you know i could have chosen a different uh, major i could have done some additional courses i could have you know prepared myself for a job there's a lot of things that i could have done right so uh, so i think uh, if we we have to kind of turn the spotlight into what i can do in this particular situation not all of the other uh, factors that caused this this particular event or this particular issue to happen so i think constantly reminding yourself into thinking okay stuff happened but what can I do now? And kind of turning that focus back into your own, uh, uh, you know, the, your sphere of influence and what you can act upon. I think it's actually quite empowering. So when you turn the focus back to yourself, uh, you realize that, okay, despite all of this nonsense, I can still do one, two, and three. And perhaps, you know, maybe one may not have the, you know, the first step may not have the necessary uh, responses, but maybe like a series of these small, small things that I do might, you know, get me out of this situation or might take me down a different path. Uh, so I, I think that's the that's the strategy is that you, you constantly have to think about turning the spotlight back onto yourself. Lovely. I, I love that. I love that. You know, instead of asking uh, why me, just focus on, OK, this has happened to me. And uh, now what can I do the best thing? At this point in time, keeping everything in place, what's the best that I can do, which can take me towards my growth, towards my success, towards opportunities and not let me get stuck into the rut of challenges, into the rut of setbacks, into the rut of stereotypes and so on and so forth. You know, Samia, I have a very interesting uh, reframing that I use whenever I hit, I get hit with uh, setbacks and uh, 
I get hit with setbacks very, very often. Like, I mean, I was talking to somebody yesterday and uh, I was telling them that the last three months uh, since April, April, May and uh, June, you know, uh, more, most of June, actually two and a half months, I couldn't do a single work because uh, because me and my entire family was hit with COVID. So I had to take that break. I had to pull myself out of my professional space and devote my 100% energy there to take care of myself, my family and everyone's health and well-being before actually getting into work back again. Now, you know, somebody was talking yesterday and they said, wow, you're living the you're living what you preach, right? You to talk about uh, setback leadership and you're actually living <laughs> that. And I was like, yeah, I mean, I do that very, very often. So the reframing that I use for myself could be a very interesting thing for everyone is that instead of asking why me, why not ask, wow, this opportunity is given to me. Now, there's a huge learning here for me. I can tell so many stories of the last two and a half months when I do my speeches, talks, etc. that that could become inspiring for people. Now, had I not been going through that challenge, I wouldn't have those stories. If you wouldn't have a, lost... That, that's actually a fantastic uh, way to put it, right? So if you want to tell interesting stories, you better, you know, you make the best of your setbacks and... and, and uh, learn from it. And that's, that does make for an interesting life and interesting adventure. Uh, it's, it's about, you know, it's about taking that particular situation and I wouldn't say making the best of it, but actually trying to learn from it and just saying, yeah, you know, things happen, but let's see what else I can do right now and just keep asking that question over and over again. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that is that is something I think leaders must do it instead of saying, oh, my God, I hate setbacks. Oh, my God, I hate challenges. Oh, my God, I, you know, I don't want these things to come on my way. Say, it's OK. Bring it on. Let's see what can we do best from this. Let's see what is my best learning from this. Let me see what stories will I be able to tell my grandchildren because of this incident that happened with me. Right. I mean, I want to look at it that way. How can I build my legacy from the challenges that I faced for my grandchildren? And trust me, these stories that you can tell your grandchildren or even children. Like I, I tell my daughter these stories as nighttime stories, you know, because she would have such starry eyed thoughts about the uh, about the um the fairy tales the cinderellas of the world or you know the snow whites of the world and come to think of it even those princesses had to go through challenges and that's when they transformed themselves every disney story has that so you know, when you tell a real person's story who went through a certain challenge and then they came back from that is a very exciting story to tell to everyone around you. So go try it. Don't say that setbacks, I hate them. Rather say, wow, setback has come. Let me see what can I do best about this, right? Now, I have one more question for you, Somya, here. As an organization, you're a COO of an organization, right? What can an organization do to help their leaders, help their employees get rid of their setbacks, their challenges, their stereotypes or glass ceilings? Is there something that you have employed in your organization that can help them? Or what would be your suggestion? I think uh, I think just more conversations around how people grew into their positions. I think that's something that... Uh, uh, that we have done. Uh, it's a lot of one-on-ones and structured one-on-ones with uh, employees uh, across the entire company. So both me and uh, the CEO, you know, we take turns and talking to people and trying to understand their personal situations and their aspirations and how the company can enable that. In in that process, you know, you also end up talking about what are some of the challenges that you faced. So when when people hear about, oh, okay, no, you, the challenges that you faced are not very very much. Uh, different from the challenges that I'm going through right now. Uh, I think it just gives people confidence. Okay, so if, if you know, if so many people have gotten past this, I too can get past it. So I think, uh, so I think I, I have to say I'm I'm very happy that you are doing this series because the more people talk about the challenges they overcome, I think it makes it okay to have challenges. And it's not like it's not a permanent challenge. It's probably a, a temporary setback that's just going to put you through a learning process, and then you come out on the other side being a lot more stronger. I think if people start realizing that uh, you are more in in a positive frame of mind to view uh, setbacks. 
So true, so true. I think one-on-one conversations happens to be one of my favorite as well. When I'm t- training uh, leaders, when I'm talking to leaders and helping them get rid of their blockages uh, and their stereotypes. So yes, I love that thing. And you're right. When when this when you see the leaders. So for example, if a CEO is telling, yes, I have been through some, this kind of a challenge or when a COO says, listen, I was chucked off from my first job. That's humanizing, right? That's humanizing for the employee to know that, yes, wow, they have been through this challenge as well. You know, or when they did not get understood by their manager well, and uh, they were taken off the organization, just being just for being not underperforming, but overperforming. So these things do happen. How do I become diplomatic then? How do I become more uh, empathetic then? And that is what helps the next generation of leaders, the upcoming leaders, to uh, not only empathize with themselves, but also feel that it's okay. It's okay to fail. It's okay to do a mistake. It's not the end of my life. It is, it's just a learning curve, right? I think that's a brilliant way of putting it out there. So Soumya, we're almost towards the end of the conversation. And I'm going to ask you just one last question. And actually, I should have asked this question at the beginning of the session. But uh, this is something that I want to definitely ask you. What does glass ceiling mean to you? Uh, I think the glass ceiling is actually the constraints that you put on yourself. Uh, perhaps because of some some of your uh, preconceived notions or perhaps some of uh, you know, the social conditioning that you've been brought up with. I think usually glass ceiling we've associated with with women, uh, but I think it can be true for anybody, right? It's it's about you know the the constraints or the boundaries that you set for yourself um, because you think that's that's how far you can reach, right? Uh, so I've and, and when you earlier you were talking about uh, some of the things that we have done with our own employees, uh, I know I've had like some employees come up to me and say, you know, I used to be so scared of talking in English uh, when I joined this company. And now today I'm talking to customers in the UK and in the US and they have grown to that where they're handling accounts and they are having these uh, really wonderful conversations with our customers. To them, in their minds, it was a, it was a bit of a, I never could see myself do that and look at where I am. So. So a person who is able to break that glass ceiling is just breaking that preconceived notion in their mind, right? And to say, let me put myself out there. Uh, so I think that's that's what a glass ceiling is. It's you have to feel extremely uncomfortable doing something because that's that's when you know you're you're growing. But to say I'm okay with being uncomfortable, I'm going to make a fool of myself perhaps the first few times. But then you know when I step out of that, I've literally broken a glass ceiling that was there before because that was one of the boundaries that I had set for myself. I can't do this. I am not, I, this is not something that I'm uh, cut out to do or whatever, you know, whatever words you use. Uh, so I think that's what glass ceiling means. And um, as you keep climbing up the ladder, you there are, there's always going to be this ceiling that comes in front of you that says, okay, you know what? You, you're not, you're not good enough for that or you're not capable of doing that or I can't, I can't see you doing that. You know, it's, it's, it's always going to keep coming up. Uh, and I think uh, 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 you have to acknowledge that constraint that you have in your mind, but then figure out how to overcome that. So I think uh, to me, that's what a glass ceiling really means. Nice, nice. You know, this reminds me of of something that I uh, say uh, to to my clients that you need to get comfortable with the uncomfortable. When you get comfortable with the uncomfortable, that's when magic happens. Absolutely. Right. And I completely, I completely agree with that. And it's, yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, that's something that I have realized in my own career as well. And, uh, in my own, uh, I would say growth path as well, that every time I felt uncomfortable doing something and still I pushed through it, get, got comfortable doing it. And at the end of it realized, oh shit, I did this, you know, and just because, oh shit, I did this means I can do this and I can do probably more than this, right? I mean, uh, I can tell you one example which happened due to uh, COVID. This was because of COVID, this happened again. That was a big setback that the whole world is going through. And of course, before that, most of my talks were physical. And I'm sure many other speaker, trainer, coaches would say the same thing, that their talks were physical. But then all of a sudden, all those uh, all those opportunities just went to zero, right? It was complete zero. And uh, then we didn't know what to do. And 
till then if somebody would tell me that look into the camera and talk just give your speeches i will say go to hell i don't want to do this i can't do it i'm uncomfortable doing it right but then in 2020 after covid hit us something happened and i ended up recording 100 plus videos wow just looking in the camera and i was like really i did this and i didn't realize i didn't have any plans of doing so many videos but just by recording just by doing it and while editing those videos i realized oh shit this is 100th video that i'm doing which means i have done so many videos so far and that's when the realization hit me saying that yes i could do this and now i i i talk virtually so easily without even you know blinking my eyes twice or without even skipping a heartbeat saying that oh no i can't do this right it's it's become a part and parcel of life so it's all about going ahead and becoming comfortable with that uncomfortable and getting to do uh, things like that now we are almost at the end and i want you to you know depart when when we are saying goodbye i want you to you know i want you to tell me that what are the three things those three quick things that anyone who is listening to this conversation can do to get rid of their challenges right now um i would say embrace the discomfort so seek out uh, opportunities that make you dis- uh, make you uncomfortable and this can be you know things that uh, perhaps you don't run you run perhaps you don't uh, you know uh, do some exercise do cycling pick that up because i think you can you can correlate doing something physical physically uncomfortable because i think you kind of train your mind also to say if i could do this i didn't know i could do this now i can i didn't know i could run 10 kilometers and now i can i think it builds up a muscle to say it's okay to be uncomfortable and now look you can so i think i would one of my one of the strategies would be to pick up something more tangible to challenge yourself and say i'm going to do this right so i think i think a lot of leaders i feel that's why they sign up for marathons and and all of these things is because it's it's more of a mental uh, you know battle that you're kind of fighting with yourself right uh so that's perhaps one and um uh number two would be to uh to calm down uh to not react immediately i could say do meditation uh that sounds very preachy but but i think it certainly helps uh but but whatever helps you to not not react uh immediately not not be uh not not react with a with a you know with a jerk any time you hear something but to actually take the time to process something and then react i think would be would be a second strategy that i can think of and uh, a third one uh, it's that kind of aligned between these two is is journal journaling a lot i think really really helps uh, cement the first two right so i think uh, your experiences uh, whatever you're going through uh, if there is a channel for getting that out of your system on onto an pen and a paper that's that's a habit that i have picked up thanks to a lot of really good friends who have kind of like you know who i've learned from um but i think that's been helpful for me quite a bit so just get up in the morning and write it, it's not writing for the world i'm not trying to uh, impress somebody with what i'm writing but this is like a personal writing that you do for yourself but i think that's that's been very helpful to just uh set the right perspective uh and to kind of uh, so maybe something did not go well the previous day but the minute i write it down and say you know this is what happened it's gone and it's not occupying my mind for today that means that i'm resetting back to zero and then you have the opportunity to kind of uh, you know deal with whatever today throws at you uh, and you're not carrying yesterday's baggage lovely those are brilliant three tips so first of all pick up something tangible to do and challenge your physical abilities that way you will challenge your mental abilities as well second one is take a pause just sit down before you react take time and then respond use that strategy and the third one is journal i would say i'm going to stop it here i don't want to add any other sentence to this this is all we need to know from you today because these are three things that are really really brilliant strong and useful for any leaders to take them to the next level and i'm just going to say Somia you have been incredible during the interview i loved chatting with you i loved all your insights loved your experiences i'm sure a lot of leaders will learn from you 
and will probably follow you more. You can find her on LinkedIn and other places. She has written a book as well. And I loved her storybook. She's a brilliant writer. She's a brilliant author. She must write more. Soumya, with that request, can you write more stories? I'm going to say thank you so much for coming in the show. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me, Sri Jatai. It was a wonderful experience and I enjoyed our conversation. Thank you. Wow, what a journey it has been for Soumya. Ups and downs and ups and downs and ups and downs multiple times. How many leaders can boast about such illustrious career? How many leaders can actually talk about taking opportunities after opportunities from their challenges? From the glass ceilings, from the setbacks, Soumya Mahadevan did it. And how, how amazingly she did it. What a confidence she has. Every challenge that came her way, she found a way out of it. My three learnings from this has been, how can you really turn challenges into opportunities? Using the right mindset, using the response instead of reacting and using the power of journaling. What has been your learning from today's episode? Let us know in the comments. And also, if you would want to know more about setback leadership as a concept and what are the different kinds of challenges that a leader faces in their career as well as in personal life, feel free to read my book, Setback Leadership. It's available on Amazon. You can either search up with the title Setback Leadership or the link of it is given in the description box below. I will see you in the next episode. Till then, take care, stay well, be a setback leader.